Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring guest coming right up, who's none other than the talented musician David Patrick Bryan. Now, David is an accomplished songwriter and performer who has entertained audiences all over the world. His charismatic style appeals to a broad base of music lovers. In 1965, David began his professional career as a musician and in the late 60s began traveling throughout the world, including U.S., Canada, and the Bahamas. Performing with artists like country music's John Connolly, rock and roll's Chuck Berry, The Fred Bell Show, and with members of the Ike and Turner Band. So today, David's here to talk with us about prayer and destiny. So let's welcome to the show, David. Well, thank you so much, Marianne. And so happy to be talking with you again. Oh, what a pleasure. I mean, I had such a fabulous time listening to you talk about your experiences not that long at this great event. And I just had to have you on my show to talk about it. And I'd love for you to share with our listeners your background, because, my goodness, you have this amazing background. Well, I appreciate it. I just uh, fell in love with music at an early age and, I just pursued that. That's all I wanted, and so I just pursued that. So to me, it was just simple uh, uh, hanging in there and loving music. Enjoying that. So, Well, and you toured with a few bands, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, uh, I had uh, – we were in a rock band called The Savage, and we traveled uh, around quite a bit, did uh, concerts with Chuck Berry and Ted Nugent, uh, people like that. And uh, I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. That was in my rock days. And then I had a show band on the road and uh, for several years. And then I worked with some of the Argentina Turner people, uh, John Connolly, a good friend of mine. We went through service together. Johnny had uh, like uh, 25 hits in the country music, and he's still doing well. Been a real good, a dear friend uh, all my life. And so it's just, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of... Uh, I worked with uh, Alan Krieger, my friend, and he got me a gig with uh, some of the Argentine Turner people. And so we uh, got to do that and had fun doing that and then worked the Vegas show band and just a few little things here and there. But, of course, I'll tell you what, in between all that, all those things was a lot of just playing in clubs and uh, and just help developing my, uh, my art, you know, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So. Well, it, it- Kind of like everyone, in some ways, when you start out, you're you're playing in clubs, and some people do it because they have to, and other people do it because they love music. And it's easy yeah. to tell by your music, you love music. You know? yeah. I've always said I have more love for music than talent. So, <laughs> uh, so I don't know about I, that. But I, I don't but know I do about love that. It. She's been a mm-hmm. she's been good to me. Music has. So, uh, it's well, and then um, you know, when you're going along your journey, then you you know met the woman of your dreams too, and I love hearing yeah. that story. Yeah. Well, uh, I had like I said, I had a show band that was on the road in the '70s, and uh, you know, I went through a whole lot of replacing musicians and a lot of booking agents and managers and different things with it during that seven years. And uh, we finally got in Chicago area. We're in tuxedos playing showrooms in Chicago area for about a year. Uh, booking agent booked me west, Ottawa, Illinois. And I tried to get out of it because in those days we didn't have email. We, In order to get to our uh, people, we had mailing lists, which meant I sent postcards out every week telling them where we're going to be. And uh, people are not going to want to drive two hours west and, you know, have fun and drink and dance and carry on and then dodge the police uh, two hours going back to Chicago. So uh, what happens if they don't come? They go somewhere else. Well, they might like where they go, and we might have lost some of our uh, prized uh, uh, mailing list people. So, And also, if I don't take a gig, then I have stand a chance of losing members. We have nine, had nine people in the band, so... It was hard keeping members. I had to keep them working to keep them there, keep them with me. So I tried to get out of this contract, and I tried to get out of this contract. Couldn't get it, so I took it, 
uh, and we walked into this place called Ivy's in Ottawa, Illinois. And uh, this it wasn't even finished. I mean, here we are in tuxedos in this place. It's got still you can still see some of the concrete blocks on it and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I said, "Watch me find the woman of my dreams here." And so that night, uh, I got off the first break and I walked down and uh, my eyes met my wife's eyes and and I just uh, the love bug bit me real hard there and and I asked her uh, after three days we we got together and dated and got with each other and after three days I, I knew that she was the one for me and I asked her to marry me and of course she said no but four months <laughs> later we were married so it worked out <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be a, a little note to that uh, May the 20th we'll be uh, celebrating our 40th anniversary so when this airs I'll, I've been married 40 years so, oh my so goodness my congratulations <laughs> well, thank you and we're going to be going back but, to uh, some areas that uh, we visited back then, back 40 years ago. So we're looking forward to that. I can imagine. I can imagine. That sounds like even though there's a contract you're trying to get out of initially with the booking agent, it ended yeah. up being the best contract you ever got. Yeah, there you go. You know, sometimes <laughs> we don't uh, we don't we don't see all the blessings that are involved in, in things. So. I just take it all as a good thing, and and uh, and it was it's been a good great thing for me. She's been a, a wonderful mother and grandmother and and a wife, and I uh, couldn't hope for anybody sweeter and nicer than my wife Lori. Mm. What a sweet story! I love hearing that, so I, I appreciate you sharing it again. You know, yeah. my second time hearing it, first for our audience here, and I'm sure that there's. Everyone's just going, oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, I guess I'm a softie, but I'm a romantic. I, I believe in destiny. I believe in, uh, you know, uh, soulmates. I believe in, you know, purpose. And, and I believe that destiny brought us together. So uh, that's why I wrote songs about it and this and that. Mm-hmm. Well, to talk about destiny, I know mm-hmm. that you were um, – you had a profound experience that you have shared with me. And I'd love for you yeah. to share it with our listeners, too, because I think a lot of people that go through difficult times will look for that one thread that can kind of help them. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, you can't really put a light under a bushel basket. It doesn't shine, right? So mm-hmm. uh, when I was uh, in my... Oh, let's say thirties and so, uh, married, had three kids, uh, wasn't, wasn't really involved in religion at the time. Uh, but I had a profound, well, let me go back a few years before when I first got with the band, my show band, I wrote a song called divine. And the first words of the song is there's a place, there's a time, there's a love so fine. It's divine. So, uh, Move it on up 15 years later, I'm, I'm back and uh, getting back into my religion, getting back into uh, those things, and a lot of profound things were starting to happen, you know. And so there was a place, and the place was in Lexington, Kentucky, and there was a time, and the time was the spring of 1986. And the love so fine, it's divine. Well, and I was back in, you know, praying and going to church and everything, and I found a novena. Now, I explained what a novena was at the presentation, but I, let me explain it again because a lot of people don't understand it. It's Novena means nine. It's Latin for uh, nine, nine times or something. It could be like nine uh, days or nine weeks or nine months or nine years or nine hours. So what I was to do is say this prayer nine times in one day at the same time. So if I started at 2, then I'd say it again at 3, then I would say it again at 4, then I'd say it again at 5, then I'd say it again at 6. Now, I knew enough to know that when you pray, you you best believe that your prayers are answered. You best believe everything that you're praying for, the Father hears and he knows. Uh, and what, what I mean by the Father, I mean the Creator, uh, anybody that's... It doesn't matter if you're you're Christian or Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu or what have you. Uh, uh, it's still 
it's the creator, it's still the, the uh, flow, it's still the the source, the the reason that we're here, that we're co-creators with. So I'm trying to keep away from being just one-sided on this. So I want people to understand mm-hmm. that the deep respect that I have for all religions. But I, I happen to grow up in a in a in a Catholic, uh, a Baptist <laughs> situation. Mom's Baptist; she raised me Catholic. So. Uh, that's the point I'm coming from. So I said this prayer, and I, every time I said it, I said it with complete faith that I was going to receive what I prayed for. Now, what I was praying for at the time was success in the recording business. I'd been in Nashville. I'd recorded songs. I had uh, a lot of the songs were getting good airtime on some reporting stations, and things were looking up as far as my, as far as my career goes. And so I wanted this success. I wanted to continue on in the recording business and uh, stay with that. So I'd finished uh, saying all but one of my uh, prayers, and the last one was going to come that night at, on our first break. Now, I was still playing in nightclubs and playing uh, secular music, you know, music, not religious music, but uh, the regular top 40 at the time. And so at the first break, I said, where am I going to say this? So I remembered that there was a re- there was a restroom in the motel side of the nightclub. So I went there and where I could just go in and shut the door and lock it and say my final prayer. I got uh, done praying. I started walking up, and I felt pretty good about myself because I completed it. I completed it, and I completed it, I can say, with all the faith in, in the world uh, to me. And so... I didn't know what would happen or or anything else, but as I started walking back toward the nightclub, this feeling came over me. This this experience came over me. This this super reality, I call it the real reality, came over me. The first thing that I experienced was the uh, absence of fear. Now, it wasn't an absence like it had been plucked out of my life. It was an absence like it never happened in my life. So, in other words, this reality that I was going into, this experience, never, fear never existed into it. Uh, you might think back uh, the Garden of Eden, you know, until tell the tell the downfall that then the fear started creeping in things and certainties it started getting certainties out of fear instead of out of love. Those kind of things. So I had this no fear, and then all of a sudden this love, this warm, joyful, peaceful, glowing love that I felt throughout my whole self. I was totally in love with life and everything in it, and I mean everything. I mean the couches and the walls and the people and the skies and the grass and the, everything. You see, we're all part of the four elements of earth, wind, fire, and rain. And everything in this earth is made of that. And everything that's made of that, everything in this earth, is in a blend. We're all blended together. We're all part of each other. So when people say that what you do affects me, it's it's absolutely true. You know, so I was experienced that in my soul or my mind's eye, I was experienced this blend. And I experienced this warm, joyful, glowing love that I felt throughout my whole self. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God was preparing me for things to happen later. And uh, this was the first level of of getting uh, my prayers answered. So uh, well, it, that, that but, seems so profound. My goodness, you know. Well, it was profound. Let me let me put it to you this way. Let's say, just for example, let's say that you're laying in your bed at night, and then all of a sudden this little fairy comes and and flies down and looks at you. And you're saying, I'm not asleep. This is really happening. And then all of a sudden the fairy sprinkles uh, fairy dust on you and, you, and you have this great love come over you. Now, the next day, are you going to go out and tell everybody about the fairy that, come, <laughs> that came and sit on your bed? <laughs> no, because you're going to say, they're going to think I'm crazy. Well, this is exactly what happens with near-death experiencers and, and also people like myself that have uh, got, uh, you know, experience through prayer or meditation, you know, enlightenment uh, in the Buddhist and, and things. So uh, 
So it was really, you kind of keep things in sight. And plus you start feeling different than you did before. What happens is this love, this genuine, unconditional love for all has increased your capacity of love a great, great deal. And it's also decreased a lot of your ego because the ego part of you that is self-centered compared to the selfless part of ego, you see, ego can be a very useful tool for you. If you love others as you love yourself, it can be an extremely useful tool. And and so all this stuff has left you. So now you're looking around and you're saying, I don't feel like I ever did. Things are different. Some of my certainties are gone. Some of my confidence is gone. And like I said, like 70% of the near-death experiencers will go through this and feel this, this hole in their soul, I, I call it. But it's more than that. It's, it's, it's a reason that it's opening. It's a reason for them, for me and for you, uh, you and everybody else. It's to fill it up with your destiny. Fill it up with your love for others. To fill it up with your, your helping others and, and helping this world and helping this planet. I mean, this is a great life. This is beautiful. It's wonderful. And it lasts until we die. And then we move on into the spiritual realm. And things happen there. And then we come back. But we come back with a new purpose and new goals. And it's all to help us improve uh, ourselves. It's all to help us to improve the planet. It's all for us to make the kingdom here on earth, to make life great uh, so the meek do, do inherit the earth and i mean meek i mean uh people that have, have gone through disciplines and stuff like religious disciplines or things that uh, trials and tribulations to where their uh balance how they feel and uh they can go through life with with uh, purpose and also uh kindness and and all the spiritual uh gifts that we that we we have so without getting well, too lost, I'll let you. I'll let you come. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love listening to your story, so I'm so glad yeah. we're here to talk about it. And you know what's so fascinating? Because you, you're you're okay. so dead on. It's an experience that you can have without having a near death experience. Right. Well, yeah. But you you yeah you bring those benefits in, and a lot of people think when we talk about any types of enlightenment that we have to have a near death experience. No, you, yeah, right. You're right. No, you don't. You don't have to have it. I mean, Buddha didn't have it. You know, he mm -hmm. he sat under what that Bodhi tree for a week or so, and and he had his experience. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have to sit under Bodhi tree for a dozen years. So, but uh, you know, it's however you receive this beautiful, wonderful gift. It always points you in the direction of life and that it says to you, love conquers all. Love is the way. Love is your path. When you look for your destiny, look for the things that you love. Look for how you can help other people with your gifts. Look how, at what you can do that, that, that you've always wanted to do. And, you know, life is short. So get out there and, and you know, put that on, strap it on and do it. You know, if you want to be uh, with flowers, go get you some flowers and do that. You know, do whatever whatever your destiny tells you to do. Because I think you'll find happiness there, especially when you deal with other people and help other people. Wasn't there one word that you were given during the time of having your experience that kind of put that all together for you? Well, this was this was after actually after the experience. And I sat down, um, I used, I had a place on top of the steps at the house. And when I wanted to pray, I'd sit there and, uh, and I'd go inside myself. I, this little room I built, a lot of people build their own temples in their hearts and in their souls. And, and, uh, I went in there and I, I said, uh, Lord, I said, I'm, uh, I'm, I remember saying I'm a simple minded person. I said, you have so many presets, concepts, do this, don't do this, don't not do this, and all that. And I said, I'm a simple-minded person. Can you just give me one thing that sums it all up? And so when I said that, you know, uh, he must have felt like I was uh, 
simple-minded person because I heard this shout. I mean, this was a, a shout that went through me. Now, I talked to myself. I answered myself, but I never shouted myself. And this was a shout that was so loud and so profound, and it gave me one word that explained it all for me. And that word was kindness. And I realized all I need to do is be kind. All other things will be at fall in place. And if I didn't be kind, and I know a lot of us have a little trouble at times, you know, especially when people pick on us or, or do things for to us. But I said, I can, at least I can get back up on my feet. I can forgive myself, forgive others, and get back to being kind. So it made me realize that evil is selfishness and kindness is selflessness it's helping others it's loving others it's going pointing toward love and it really resolved a whole lot of things in my head in other words it was it took a whole bible and just shrunk it down to one word mm. so that that was pretty good for me <laughs> well you you get this this one word that just impacted you in such a way that you brought so much from it it, it really you know, how just one simple word can expand to mean so much. Well, it, yeah, and I, I always feel very humble in receiving that word. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I've always heard that you're supposed to hear a, like a, a simple little soft voice, you know. And I, there has been occasions I think I've, I've heard that. But this was not definitely not a soft voice. It's just a loud shout. And uh, it it took me by surprise, actually. I know it's I know some things that I say sound, you know, I don't know. I mean, what was he drinking or what? No, you know, these things I tell you for your benefit. I tell you for your your audience's benefit. You know, I already know about them, and if they choose to believe, then great. Then they can understand it and they can carry it. They can put it in their toolbox and they can carry it and and work on the things that they want to work on. They choose not to. That's okay. You know, that's their, that's their prerogative. And, and so, you know, I, I want to give it, I at least want to do my part and give the opportunity to people to, to choose one way or the other. Well, and the thing is, is more people believe this than, than you know. And most of the time they're just afraid mm -hmm. to talk about their experiences or their thoughts or you know, what they're going through because, it, you know, just like you said, they don't want to be judged because people are like, wow, you know, what's, what's going on with that person? But I think we're coming into an age where more and more people are discussing this and it's becoming a little bit more commonplace. You're right. And, you know, this politically uh, correct stuff, uh, well, I call it politically correct uh, stuff, you know, sometimes interferes with people actually saying what's on their mind. And, uh, you know, People have got to just understand something. If it's the truth, it's the truth. And so if you believe it's the truth, then you then you practice it. If you're not sure, then you keep studying and keep uh, reading and trying to figure out what it is. You know, the more we read, the more we study, the more we think, the better off, the more tools we have to determine uh, what's best for us as individuals. But we got to understand something, too, is... While we're trying to be better and help other people, we have to understand how other people feel. And we have to put them in us and us in them in order to, in order to be one with, with each other. So I think that's where kindness does it all for you. Yeah, it brings it all together. No, well, I I know that you've made some beautiful music over the years, and I've enjoyed your um, CD, You Are My Friends. I think it's fabulous. Where can our listeners pick up a copy of this if they want to um, purchase your CD as well? Well, they can go to my website, and it's, of course, www.davidpatrickbryan, and Brian spelled B-R-Y-A-N, all one word, davidpatrickbryan.com. And uh, they can go there and they can buy. I've got three CDs that, uh, that are ready, you know, are already recorded. And I've got uh, the new material that's uh, waiting to be recorded. And hopefully we'll get that done 
uh, soon as soon as we can. But uh, so they can go there and, and check it out. Also, they can go on the the site and there's digital downloads, and they can go listen to all all my music, uh, and uh, uh, that way. And you know, it's mm-hmm. uh, the, the easiest way to do it. So it's David Patrick Bryan dot com. Well, I think sharing your story brings such a gift to so many people, and I really applaud you for doing that with us today. What are some of the the things that you want people to take away from your story? Oh, I just want people to re- I just want people to realize that all this negativity, all this low road stuff that we we all this hate and all this. Uh, BS that's negative, it doesn't really, it's misemotions. It doesn't really help anything. It just gets in the way of us eventually that we're going to be a oneness. And we're, we're, a lot of us are striving for that oneness. We're not perfect, and we make mistakes, and we have to forgive ourselves, and we have to forgive each other, but we're still striving toward that goal. And what I'm say, what I would say would be just stay on the high road. Be yourself. Look at the things you love. I believe God put them in there for you, and I believe that uh, they're there for you to uh, fulfill and develop. And you know, I think your soul improvements and and your spiritual experiences are what you take to Yahweh when you leave. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting that word kindness. A lot of times people, it's really easy to dish that out to everyone around us. But when it comes to self-kindness, it's like, ooh, yeah, we could be our own worst (laughs) critic. Well, that's, people talk about the devil. I I say, look, you know, we give ourselves hell, you know. Sometimes we're our own little devil there on ourselves. And so that's why I say get out of the negative and stay up in the positive as much as possible. I found this to be true too. When people are angry, you see people angry, and they're they're not being their self; they're being their angry self. And sometimes just a word like "Are you okay?" can change their whole attitude. Don't be afraid to go and help somebody that's mad. Don't be afraid to go and help somebody that's crying. Don't be afraid to go and help somebody for any reason. You know. It's it's so easy to compliment people and tell them how how beautiful they are. We get out of ourselves when we do that. And we get into other people. And you know, people need to hear they're beautiful. I don't care if they they've heard it all day long. They love hearing it because we are beautiful. Each and every one of us are spirit. We are orbs. We are continuous energy, creative energy. We are co-creators made in the image and likeness of the Creator. And like I said, we might have a little dust on us. We just got to brush it off. (laughs) And we do that by (laughs) being kind. (laughs) Well, and and we never know. We could be the one person that entire day that has been kind to somebody else that they probably haven't had in a very long time. You know, what a gift that would be. Well, that's so true. Uh, you never know. I, I was I was playing at a nursing home and I was taking my equipment out and this lady was behind me in a wheelchair and she didn't speak but she was clapping her hands behind me. And I turned around and she was looking at me and I said, "Well, thank you." And she was she was in where I was performing at. And I figured I must have played a song or so that she liked. Nurse came out and said, "Mr. Brian, do you know so and so?" I said, "No." She was just in there when I was playing music. She said, Mr. Bryan, that's the first time she's responded in three years. Mm. That was the first time that lady has responded to anything in three years, and it was music. Music was a vehicle, and that's why I love music. It's such a... It's you make me a, cry on that one. <laughs> yeah, that, that almost made me too, I, I, but it's it's uh, it's amazing what... what uh, music helps. How music helps. Just from, just think, even when you were younger, it helped you. In times you were blue, you know. Just think how much it helps you as you get older too. So uh, that's what I try to. Uh, I love it, and that's why I like to write about these experiences, 
And that's what I've been getting into the last few years is just writing about my experiences and trying to make it, a, a, you know, something that's that all people, all face, all race can uh, can appreciate. Mm-hmm. Thanks. The stories that you share are not just for um, people of one certain type of religion or economic base or social status or race or anything like that. It's for all people because we're, you know, you talk about dealing with fear, you know, and, and prayer and destiny and of course right. kindness. And that's, that's almost like the basis of humanity. I think so. I think you're absolutely right. You hit the nail on the head. Uh, I believe that w- when we go, when we die, we're of one uh, experience. We're, we're no longer have subconscious, conscious, and super conscious minds. We're just all one mind. And we're in a place that I described before, without fear, without any negative feelings, all in the blend, all in uh, love. And that when we return, before we return back to Earth, uh, we go through a process with some of the uh, wise the wise people, you know, and develop what plan that we're going to do to help promote us and help us to become better uh, soul spirits. And uh, so then we were born uh, and we start anew with a clean uh, slate. And, you know, we start, we have to learn our, our, uh, uh, our uh, destinies and our, what we need and what we like and what we love and our personalities. And so, the more we are kind, the more we are positive, the more we have on the high road, and the more the teachers help us and whoever our teachers are to stay on those high roads and and stay in faith with uh, life and love, uh, the better we, we're going to be. So I think we have a lot of challenges when we begin our lives and, and in the middle and even toward the end, but that's... That's why this is a beautiful and wonderful place because it does give us an opportunity to grow and develop. Is that too much for you? No, not at all. <laughs> I just, that's no, just what I believe. This is, you know, mm-hmm. uh, without having a near death experience or, or doing that or going back and seeing it, uh, you know, and like through hypnosis or something. I can only speculate and say I believe this, but this is what I believe. Well, what's fabulous, it's based off your personal experience, what's worked for you. And I well, so appreciate yeah. you, you sharing that, you know. Yeah, and you know, your your experiences give you a common denominator to kind of understand if someone, something else that you hear or something is going in the right direction or not. So it, it helps you in determining what you, what you're going to believe in. So I find that that important, uh, you know. That's well, yeah. What else can well, we and so, <laughs> <laughs> well, we will definitely have you back on again, David. I mean, my goodness, it's always such a pleasure to talk with you and, you know, hear your story and just the compassion that emanates from you is something that's very tangible even on a radio show. I'd love yeah. for you to share one more time your website so our listeners can connect with you and be part of your community. Okay. Well, it's all one word, davidpatrickbryan.com, and Brian is spelled B-R-Y-A-N. Okay. Any ways to spell it, but it's this ours is B-R-Y-A-N. And uh, I was going to have, when I did my website, I was gonna, just going to have it David Bryan, but... Uh, found out there was already a website there that was the keyboard player for Bon Jovi. So I put Patrick <laughs> in so it's so to to make the difference. So I just and I've enjoyed heaven. It's a long thing to type, but I've enjoyed heaven. So David Patrick Bryan dot com. Uh you can get my contact information. I, I don't mind people calling me direct or uh emailing me or what whatever, whatever they want to do. I'm happy to uh or text me. I'm happy to talk mm-hmm. to anybody. And uh, so, you know, there you go. So. There you go. Well, you know, David, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. 
Well, you're more than welcome. And it's really nice, a pleasure to meet you, and thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you, David. It's been such a pleasure to spend this time with you. I know how gifted and talented you are, and I'm so glad you were able to share your story with us here today. I highly suggest everyone go visit his website, davidpatrickbryan.com, and of course, pick up a couple of his downloads. He's got a lot of music that's just very inspiring on downloads, so you want to start your day off right. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information. <music>